you have, let's go ahead and start with um, the first question I'd like to ask Mark is, can you talk for a few minutes about the process by which you became an agent and then talk about some of the people that you've worked with over the course of your career? Well, you know, I, I'm actually particularly proud of how I evolved into this business because unlike 99% of people who are agents and managers, uh, I actually started on the creative side. I was a fashion illustrator and a layout artist in an animation studio. So uh, I not only started on the creative side of, of the business, and I say the business because I was working in a studio animation studio where we were doing uh, predominantly uh, uh, Saturday morning television animation, as well as title sequences like Pink Panther and things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm really familiar with the uh, experience of sitting across the desk from somebody who's flipping through your portfolio and dealing with rejection and, and everybody, whether you're writer, director, actor, producer, you're, you all are dealing with some version of being evaluated and either accepted or rejected on a regular basis. And of course, the business being what it is, it's usually more rejection than anything else. Um, you don't have to be accepted all the time to be successful. You just have to be accepted often enough to be successful. <laughs> but everybody, everybody gets rejected. Um, so having done that for a few years, uh, for a variety of reasons, I decided uh, that those two areas of the arts were ultimately not going to be a, a viable career path for me um, for reasons that are not worth going into here. Um, and I was looking around for what to do next. I hadn't really had a taste of the business, but from the little I knew about it, as I was looking for the next thing to do, I didn't want to go back to school. And uh, this was in my mid-20s. And, as a, and I was looking for an industry where there was the opportunity to make a lot of moves up sideways laterally uh, and do different things and bring one's experience uh, to whatever new task one was doing and it would be valuable and also a business where you could grow in unlimited ways both financially and otherwise where you weren't limited to three percent or five percent merit increases every year and my experience as an artist when I worked temporary jobs was that you know two three weeks into the job I could look down the road in whatever industry I was working in selling furniture driving a bus working for a hotel and I did all that stuff uh, I could see where I'd be in five years and 10 years and 15 years what my title would be what my salary would be and the minute I had that figured out I was bored so that usually took about three weeks um, and the entertainment industry struck me as a business where you could do a lot of things um, and it was inherently creative whether you were on the business side or the creative side, everybody working in the business is a link in the creative chain that ultimately results in movies and TV shows and now digital shows and whatever and entertainment content. Uh, and I like the idea of being part of that chain that will ultimately would result in something creative and entertaining that went out to a mass audience. So that was my motivation. So, uh, how do you get into business? Uh, you know, I applied at two of the big agencies and got accepted at one of them, went to work in the mailroom. That's what you do. Started Xeroxing scripts and delivering mail and, you know, doing uh, messenger runs out uh, around town to the studios and, and uh, clawed my way up from there. Mm -hmm. it was the, the normal story. <laughs> Except it's not really all that normal these days, I don't think. Um, so can you talk for a few minutes about have have you represented writers and actors and producers and writers directors actors producers production companies I represented my interest was always uh, writers predominantly mm -hmm. and every was literary based so in my first job as an agent I worked at a small agency we were a talent agency they hired me to help create a literary department and while I was doing that in order to you know pay my way I had to cover casting directors and sell actors but I didn't really like representing actors, not because there was anything wrong with actors, but I felt that representing writers, I could be much more creative. The thing about being an actor, uh, until you get to be a star and the studios want to develop specifically for you, you have to wait for somebody else to sell an idea, write a script, the script has to get greenlit, and then you 
gets submitted, you either submit yourself or your agent or manager submits you, and you're competing with everybody else in town mm-hmm. that meets the, the characteristics of that role that's being cast. And so as an agent, I felt like, well, that's, I, that's not very, from my point of view, that wasn't very creative. With writers, along with the fact that I just, I loved, you know, I, I was a voracious reader as a kid and I loved the written word. Mm-hmm. But as a, uh, representing writers, I could say to a writer, you know, this network or that studio wants a certain kind of project and the writer would go create it and then we'd go out and try to sell it. Or, you know, the studio had an idea, you know, uh, had an idea or the writer would come to me with a script or an idea that wasn't like anything the buyers were asking for. And if I loved it enough, I could go out and create a market for it. I could convince a buyer to buy it. So it engaged me in a way that the actor business didn't engage me. Mm -hmm. Once I was representing writers and kind of doing business, it was a natural segue to represent producers and directors because you get involved with all of those people uh, in the, in the development stage before content goes into production. Mm-hmm. So we need a production company or a producer to set something up or immediately after you set something up, you generally, you know, you bring in a director before something goes into production. So the more of the pieces, the more of the development pieces that I was representing, the more capable I was to sell projects and the more uh, powerful it made me on behalf of everybody I represented. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I became a packaging agent. What does that mean? What is that? What is that specifically? A packaging agent. Well, the, here's the, the the technical definition and the, and, the, and the practical definition. So the technical definition of a packaging uh, of packaging is that you are putting together as many elements as you need in order to essentially make the buyers have to say yes to the project. Mm-hmm. It's about strengthening the project to, to facilitate a sale. Mm-hmm. Now, it, at the end of the day, when you're representing people of sufficient stature, if you're representing Tom Hanks or you know, whoever the star du jour is, uh, that's a package with one element. Or if you're representing a best-selling book, you, know, you take a package position, means you commission it, the project differently. So you're putting really as few or as many pro, uh, elements, creative elements together as it takes to sell the project. That's what a packaging agent does. So if you personally present writers and directors and producers and production companies, you're in a better, you have access to all those people, so you're in a better position to put those elements together. If you don't represent all those people, then you have to take the element you do represent, let's say it's a writer with a script, and you have to go to another agent to try to get a director or another agent to get a producer or you go directly to the producer or production company, and that can be done, it's just harder. Do you wanna sort of review um, the kinds of agents that the minimum number of agent types do you think people should be aware of? Agents do specialize, and as the business has become broader and broader, they tend to specialize more because no, no one person can kind of cover the whole ecosystem. At the big agencies, uh, they have very specific areas of responsibility. Uh, so, you know, an agent will cover a studio uh, or a network or a series of production companies or a talent agent will cover certain casting directors. Now, it, that, that's not going to that's not going to negatively impact the client that they cover a finite area because they have other agents there. And, and so they all work for each other's clients and they all sell the, the agency clients at, in their different areas. But when you're going to a small agency or a mid-sized agency that's got a limited number of agents, if somebody's, you know, if somebody's spending most of their time covering the networks, for example, uh, and the cable companies, they're not necessarily going to know the digital business very well. Or if they're heavily in the digital business, they're not necessarily going to know the network business very well. Uh, or if they're representing stars, and they're making deals with studio heads, they're not necessarily going to have a great relationship with casting directors. So, you know, for new, for people, for newer talent, meaning it's earlier in their career, I always like to recommend that they look for young agents at uh, reputable or powerful agencies. So if you're using the, you know, CAA as an example, if you're 
if you don't have a lot of credits, if you're just starting out and you go to CAA, I think you're much better off getting uh, an agent who's recently been promoted from assistant to agent mm -hmm. because those people can't sign stars. And the way that they build their careers, they find really talented people and they're really hungry and you're really hungry and they find talented people and they work their asses off and they make stars out of them. And those people will work much harder for you than the people that already represent Tom Hanks and, you know, and all the, all the A-listers because they don't have, they're not, the people that represent the A-listers don't want to invest in somebody that's going to take five, seven, ten years to evolve into, you know, a regularly working uh, artist who's making decent money because it takes that long. One of the things that talking to you really revealed to me is that somebody who's a writer, somebody who's a writer producer, need, might need somebody a different rep, form of representation, a whole different kind of representation, and different different properties in their representative than somebody who is, is a writer who wants to write for television because you're probably not going to be producing television your first day, or, and versus somebody that is. At, um, uh, an actor producer. In other words, the, the notion that any agent is as good as any other agent doesn't take into account that your career is on a specific path and you need to get the right kind of guy for the kind of work that you plan to be doing going forward. Well, underlying what you're saying is the, is the fact that uh, many people, when they're starting out in their career, have aspirations to be hyphenates and to do, mm -hmm. to act and direct, to write, and produce, mm -hmm. to write in television and films and you can't pursue all those things at once mm -hmm. you evolve you start out focusing in one area and you evolve from there as you gain strength and credibility in your one area then at a certain point you have the leverage and the credibility to say now i want to do this and in order to get a buyer to let you do you know if you're a writer in order to be able to direct you have to get to a point where they want you as a writer bad enough that you can say, I want to direct this next thing. And if they want to hire you, your writing services, they have to give you the directing opportunity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen at the beginning of your career. And when an agent says to you, well, do you, you know, if you're a writer, for example, or a director or a producer, and an agent says to you, you know, when they're interviewing you uh, initially, would well, you want to do TV or film? And when you say you want to do both, that doesn't tell them, that you've got broad interest. What that tells them is that you're not focused. Mm, and that a, doesn't excite them, that turns them off. Can you sort of give some sense of the process that people have to go through from you know, first identifying who they're gonna try to get as representation and then process of initial outreach, et cetera? Like how, what, what does that flow look like? First of all, uh, most people tend to, uh, because they're driven by their ambition, they tend to uh, go out to try to get representation before they're ready <laughs> because they believe the myth that you need the agent to launch your career. And to some extent, it, it's certainly helpful, but you, the agent is only as good as the ammunition that you provide. Hmm. The agent. And so if you're not ready for an agent, if you haven't, acted enough and have a good reel, if you haven't written enough uh, and a variety of writing samples to prove that you, you're, you not only have the skill and the craft, but you can repeat it again and again and again, mm -hmm. you've been, uh, uh, an assignment. If you haven't directed enough, um, then the agent has no reason to believe that you can deliver. And why would the agent uh, spec their time and their energy you know, people, the, the artists don't realize that it actually costs money for an agent to represent somebody. Hmm. The agent is, the agent is devoting time. The agent is taking buyers out to breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, in order to get, build relationships and get familiar with what their taste is and what they want. So they can actually make a phone call and say, here's somebody you ought to meet. Uh, they're de the time they're devoting to the client who's not making any money, they're not devoting to somebody else mm -hmm. making money. So it's actually costing them money to represent you. Um, so they're, they're very demanding about what they want. You have to prove yourself. Now, the other thing is that everybody 
who sells anything is selling to a customer. Mm -hmm. I've never met a writer, director, producer, or actor who views producers or casting directors or studio or network executives as customers. Mm -hmm. So they don't ever come at this from the point of view of what does my customer want? Oh. They, come, they come at it from the point of view of this is what I want. I want them to want me. I want them to hire me. I want them to love my script. But they have no concept of what the person they're talking to wants or needs. And the whole approach when you're selling, I mean, if you've ever sold furniture or shoes or a car or anything, if you're not totally focused on what your customer wants and how to turn them on, you're not going to make a sale. Guy spends his whole time telling you how much he wants to sell you a car and how close he is to his month's quota. Mm -hmm. how, how likely is it you're going to buy a car from him? That's true. That's very true. Well, that's what most actors and writers and directors do. I'm really good. This, my screenplay is really great. You should look at my reel. It's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, here's, and I started dancing when I was four years old. And the yes, kids want a picture of me. Exactly. <laughs> started dancing when I was four years old. And, you know, my mother just thinks I'm the second coming. <laughs> so, you know, all so, my aunts and uncles have looked at my reel and they all think I'm great. You know, or this is the next big movie. You can't imagine how many times I've heard this or read it in a query letter. Mm -hmm. This is the next big, this is, this is going to be the next Avatar. This is going to be the next Titanic. This is going to be the next Star Wars. <laughs> Every executive knows that they don't know what the next big movie is going to be. Why would you know what the next big movie is going to be? <laughs> what comes after that should be something like, and I have 10,000 other people who say so because they like the book I wrote. And look, here's a copy of it. So, so, the, so in, in this approach, mm -hmm. the trick is not to tell them everything about yourself or your project. The trick is not to try to squeeze as much information into your introduction or your five minutes or your 20 minutes that you have with somebody. The trick is to be selective and tell them only enough to make them curious so that they want more. So that they say, well, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Or you meet them in an elevator, literally, you're giving them the elevator pitch. Your goal is not to sell them something. Your goal is to get them to say, here's my card. I want you to come into my office and give me a, a pitch. When, when you're first reaching out to them, the first step is, your, your first objective is to get them to ask you for a pitch or to ask to read your stuff. It's like to get them to the next step in the process of accepting you as opposed to how to leap to the end of the process. Exactly. I, you know, I, had, I was contacted by a writer uh, recently who was very frustrated who said she's not getting any response to her query letters. Mm -hmm. said, send, me your, send me what you're sending to people and let me look at it. So she sent it and I read it and it was, you know, it was a normal query letter that had two or three paragraphs that were a synopsis of the script and it was all the reasons why she thought it was a great movie etc cetera, etc cetera. and i said to her what's the purpose of your query letter and she said to get a movie made and to get it out there i said no that's not the purpose mm -hmm. i said what's the purpose of your query letter and then she said well to get an agent and i said no that's not the purpose of your query letter either <laughs> i said you want to know what the purpose of your query letter is mm -hmm. what the purpose of your query letter is to get the person who's reading the letter to call you and request a copy of your script. You know, you have to figure out how to do that. And you can start by understanding the language and writing coherent sentences and spelling words correctly. Because mm -hmm. nobody's going to care how good your script is or how good your story is if you can't spell correctly. Mm -hmm. you read your script. But, you know, so that's, you got you to gotta first start with, the right point of view about how to approach people and mm -hmm. figure out what they want and what they need. The first meeting we ever had, one of the things you said that was interesting to me was you said, everybody thinks that they've got something unique. And one weekend. I sat down with my stack of, I sat down with my stack of scripts one Saturday. I yeah. usually, usually took, you know, 20 to 30 scripts home every weekend. Mm -hmm. And I sat down with a stack and I read one script. It was a war story. And I finished it and put it down. I picked up the second script by a different writer. And it was 
essentially the same story, same war story. And I put that down, I picked up the third script, and it was the same story. <laughs> so it's not the case. So I think there's this notion that just that if you're somebody who wears a suit or you're somebody that does business and you're working in the entertainment industry, well, you're, you're, you're like, you're not talented, you don't know scripts, you don't, ha you don't understand, uh, you know, this creative process that's so magical. When really the truth is, you go, yeah, I know, we've seen a lot of scripts, we know a lot of stories. So We don't, but, we don't, claim, we don't claim to be writers, <laughs> but we've read, agents have read way more scripts than any writer has read. That's true. And, you know, when, I'm, when I am sitting with a showrunner who sold a series, let's say I'm sitting with a showrunner who's managed to sell several, several series, and that's a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. they don't come near anywhere near having sold as many shows as I have. Now the agents haven't written the shows, but we've had to figure out who the right buyer is. We've had to call and give an elevator pitch and get that meeting set up. We've mm -hmm. had to take the writer or producer in and do that presentation. And we often have to prep them for how to, how to present it. Mm -hmm. And then we have to massage, you know, unless it's a buy in the room, which doesn't happen very often. Then we have to massage, the buyer and you know turn that into a sale and then you have to shepherd the thing through the development process and get it green lit so hmm. you know if a writer sells one show that's it they're busy on that for the next year or two the minute i'm done with that meeting i've got to move to the next client and do it again and again and again and again wow. so it's it's time to start you know you may not like agents they may not always be the most pleasant personalities but you got to at least you know, don't go in hating them because that won't get you anywhere. You got to at least respect the fact that they they know something. Well, and I think appreciate the fact that they do have expertise and they have uh, they have specific expertise and they do under, understand and grapple with issues of character. And it, because they are, you know, when, when somebody's complaining to them about a script that's not working for some reason or there's notes that have they can't be interpreted, they're the ones working with the writer and talking to the the people that are the purchasing the script. They're the ones that are Provide, helping to provide that interface to, to make it so that transaction goes forward. So it's right. not, they're not ignorant of the, they're not ignorant of the creative elements. It's just that and they're, they're, and they're making a creative judgment when they, when they mm -hmm. say to their client, let's go pitch to this company or let's go pitch to that production entity or let's go pitch to that cable company. They're making a creative judgment about uh, a marriage that they're going to put together between you, the artist and you know whoever the other elements are and if they're right more than they're wrong you get to have a career if they're if they've got terrible creative judgment about how to make those marriages it's not going to work so the agents that do it again and again and again they, they are doing something very creative that is true that's very interesting. Doing, you know in the same way that a, in the same way the casting director has to be able to look at actors and say I know that actor can can do that role. Be, they they haven't done anything like that before, but I know that they can do that based on blah, 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 whatever their inner process is. And directors make those decisions, and producers make those decisions. Agents are doing the same thing. A lot of times, people imagine that you know you've written a good script, you've given it to the agent, the agent is taking it around, and and they're sort of imagining that the agent's going to show it to people and they're going to buy it. But that's not actually the process. What the process is is you meet. You're the one that actually does the pitch is the person, if it's a, if it's a writer or probably if it's a producer, probably if it's anybody, it's, there's the person that goes into the room who meets with the buyer and the buyer buys, decides that that's what they want. And that's the person that they want to work with from a collaborative standpoint. So it's not just the, you don't just have to be good at your actual craft. You have to be good in the room with the people that are actually going to make the purchase decision. It's very hard work and they're going to hang out with you for a long time and they only want to hang out with people that they like. So, you know, the agent, the agent opens the door, uh, the agent introduces you, but you have to go in and you have to, you have to sell yourself. You have to sell yourself. And there are things that you need to know how to do. You need to know how to take notes. You need to know mm -hmm. how to assert, your creative vision and still make the, the executive feel like, you know, they're important in the process, even sometimes that they're in control, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, and things don't happen overnight. You know, this new movie that's, uh, <clears throat> this new movie that's uh, just about to come out with Russell Crowe and uh, Shia LaBeouf, 
Mm -hmm. Shane Black wrote. Mm -hmm. Took him fifteen years to sell it, and he's got multiple hit movies under his belt. And he did took him thirteen years to sell that script. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, and and it's not like he's not at the top of the industry. It's just it, it, some he's projects take a time. He's, to an a -lister. he's an A-lister. The marketplace has specific tastes, and it changes, and there are reasons why things don't sell, and reasons why they do sell, and it's frustrating and we can't always understand it and figure it out and that's just you know you got to be you got to be patient patient and you've got to persevere and you've got to keep working on other projects so that yeah. so, so it's very important that you be prolific in order to be successful in other yeah. words it is not the case that you that you've written one great script you should be thinking in terms of i've written i'm constantly writing i'm constantly creating new content i'm constantly if you're an actor you have to act it doesn't matter whether you get getting paid or not. If you're a writer, you got to write, whether you're getting paid or not. If you're a director, you've got to look for opportunities to direct. Uh, if you're a producer, then you better be out trying to raise money so you can produce things, you know, in between studio jobs when somebody's willing to pay you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got to always keep working. Work begets work and you have to keep working. Because the other thing is that everybody that is working in the business understands that it's really hard work. Mm -hmm. You're not working as hard as they're working. Mm -hmm. Even when you're not getting paid, they don't want to be in business with you. Right. They don't want to burden themselves with somebody that's going to struggle under the, under the force of having. Yeah, or uh, somebody that's not going to pull their weight. That's interesting. But the first step is, are you ready to contact them? Are you contacting them with the right thing? And then so are you contacting is, them the right way? This is a good opportunity to share uh, a story, an old Hollywood story that I don't know from personal experience, but I've heard it a number of times. Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, was, before he became a, a working writer in television, was a cop. And he had, he decided, he got a list of the literary agents in town from the WGA, and he researched all of them. He pinpointed an agent that he wanted to represent him. His office was up on Sunset. And Roddenberry, at the end of the workday, when he was on patrol, parked himself outside the agent's office, figuring sooner or later the agent was going to leave the office when he was there, and Roddenberry was going to figure out some way to meet him. So the way I heard it was this agent leaves the office in his car. Roddenberry follows him when he's on duty. <laughs> The guy makes some sort of a traffic violation, probably a minor violation. Roddenberry pulls him over, starts chatting him up while he's doing, you know, while he's making like he's going to write him a ticket. And the guy says, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm actually, he pretends he doesn't know the guy's an agent. He says, well, actually, I'm an aspiring television writer. Oh, my God, I'm an agent. You know, blah, blah, blah. You want me to read your stuff? And, you know, he says, yeah, that'd be great. So, you know, maybe I can set up a meeting for you, you know, get, pitch you some story. You know, you can pitch stories to a producer. Roddenberry says, that's great. Well, I will, you know, I'll give you, let you off with a warning if you, you know, get me a meeting. So <laughs> the, the agent, literally the agent sets up a meeting for him with a producer at Paramount. Roddenberry, you know, when he's off duty, he goes in there. Now, the, the part of the story I really love is that he's very nervous because he's never pitched before. And he takes, he's in his cities and he takes his coat off and he puts it over the back of the chair and he's sitting at the in front of the producer's desk and he pitches whatever story and the producer's kind of looking at him wide-eyed and Roddenberry thinks that he's, uh, you know, that he's really enamored of the story he's pitching and the, he gets done pitching and the producer says, great story, great story, let's, I want to buy it, you know, uh, I want you to write the script. And Roddenberry's excited and he grabs his coat and he leaves the office and he realizes afterwards that he forgot that he was carrying a gun in a, in a shoulder holster. <laughs> They all, they all <laughs> killed guns when they're off. <laughs> and the whole time he was pitching, the producer was looking at this gun under his arm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you're saying we should we should uh, we should pitch. Um, when, pitch you, well, when you go when you go to meet an agent, go packing, and <laughs> you're bound to get a meeting. No, but the, but the point of the story is that. He was creative about how he said about meeting that agent. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't just send a letter. He didn't just make a phone call. You know, I always like to, you know, 
I assume we've got in the in our group here we've got a lot of single people. You know, if you see somebody in a club or in a bar or at a party that you think is attractive and you want to meet them, mm -hmm. the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out a way to approach them that doesn't make you sound like every other schmo. Mm -hmm. If you sound like if your line is is a line they've heard from everybody else before, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. You got to figure out a way to stand out. Same thing with agents and managers. They get query letters all day long. They get cold emails all day long. They're not going to pick up any cold calls from people they don't know. How are you going to make yourself, how are you going to make yourself stand out from the crowd? Find out, you know, who they know, what are they, who are the people they're in business with. But see, you know what this presupposes is that you know the name of the agent that you want. If you're doing it, I think a lot of times when people, when um, people are creative professionals are looking for representation, they have the notion that one size fits all. I need a agent. I need a manager. And you don't, you don't need, need, the agent. You need the right agent. People have this understanding or this belief that there's one size fits all and there's just not. There's not. There's not. You have to look for your own way in. Some people do it by building a, a presence online, producing their own stuff with their iPhones and, you know, creating YouTube channels. And some people do it by, you know, I had a, I had a client when I, years ago when I signed him. He had 19 scripts he'd written of all different genres. If somebody who doesn't have a career comes to me and says, they've got 19 or 20 scripts, I'm curious. Somebody says, I've just finished a script. I'm dying to have you see it. I, I think it's a really great script. You know, if I'll ask them, you know, how many scripts have you written? If it's, if they've only written one script, if it's the best script I've ever read, I won't get involved. Really? Yeah. What's how, do I, how do I know they can do it again? Ah, that's amazing. That's an interesting insight. So it's not so the first, script, the first script is always got some it's always imbued with a level of passion that the second or third or fifth script doesn't have. Mm -hmm. I don't they've written one script, they haven't developed their craft yet. How do I know if they if they are given an assignment, it's not a story that they created themselves, that they have the craft to write a script that's producible. I don't know that unless they've written multiple scripts. That's a very interesting insight. I think a lot of times people think that if I just produce, if, if I've got the world's greatest script, all I need is one good script, or I only have one good story in me. You, and need I need five good scripts. you need five good scripts. Wow. If somebody says, well, I've, I finished one script and I'm working on my next one, or I finished one script, the second one needs a rewrite, I'm working on my third, great. When you get to five finished ones that are ready to show, call me again. That's amazing. I think the other thing you point out is that is is that um, if you're a professional, if you're a professional writer, professional filmmaker, professional director, professional actor, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've got enough pieces for an agent to be able to sell. They need to be able because they have to take you into different environments and pitch you for different projects. And how are they going to do that when they've got nothing to show? Many, many, many projects have been sold when a writer or producer or director for that matter, goes into a room with executives, pitches something, the executive says, great story, not for us, I really like you though, what else do you have? And they go, well, I wasn't gonna pitch this, but I've got this story about, the pump. boom, sale. I've heard that's happened dozens of times. Right. If you don't have, if, if somebody reads your script and says, I really love this script, what else do you have and you don't have anything? That's the end of the conversation. Same with an actor. If you've done one role in a school play or in a community play or a student film or whatever, and you really love it, you really love to act, and you go to an agent and you go, you know, I did this thing, here's a, here's a scene, or here's a couple of scenes, or look at this short, you know, look at this 20 minute short that I starred in, and I really want to act and I really think I can be great. You know, I just need an opportunity. They're not going to sign you. You haven't done enough. You haven't shown any, any real ambition. You haven't shown any perseverance. Forget about showing talent. You haven't shown any drive. So, so that's kind of another thing that's interesting. Is, it, is there a danger in approaching agents too early? 
like to going to them before before you're ready to be seen uh well i mean the only danger is that a that particular agent you know if you approach them a second or third time they you know probably wouldn't uh wouldn't respond um you know if uh, i mean i just it's not so much that there's a danger in going too early it's that it's it's senseless to go too early how what are you achieving anybody that would sign you before you're ready is not somebody you want to be represented by that's true because they're not they're not making they're not using good judgment in signing you wow if you're not ready and they're interested they're probably not a good agent wow that's interesting i've never heard anybody say that but that is actually really true you you you, you need to make sure it, not all it's not one size fits all in terms of agents and it's not the case that any agent will do and it's not the case that somebody who makes bad judgments in terms of the clients they bring on is going to make better judgments or decisions when pitching you here's something i can almost guarantee you and this is this is true more for actors than for writers and directors mm -hmm. if you're an actor and you haven't done enough and you go for example to a smaller mid-size agency and an agent signs you the chances are that that agent is signing a lot of people that are not ready because their their strategy is some of them are going to hit and i've got i'm giving myself lots of options i'm signing 50 people instead of 10 people and out of those 50 some of them are going to work and the others will just you know the others will just evaporate they'll fire me or i'll fire them that's not a good strategy you want somebody that believes in your talent and somebody who's proactively taking you into the marketplace and finding opportunities for you you don't want to just be a name on a list so when you talk about, we've been talking about agents for the most part, but can you talk sort of about the difference between agents and managers and which, if it, either you, sh you think someone should approach first or, because I think that's something that people don't know. Like, should I have a manager? Do I need to have a manager just because I can't get an agent or does a manager and agent do different things? Well, it, it's not really so mu much a matter of should. Um, if you have an agent, Agents generally are not going to be inclined to introduce you to managers for a variety of reasons. I mean, a good agent is going to be, should be doing the job adequately so that from the agent's point of view, you don't need a manager. And an agent's going to feel like if you have a manager, if they bring a manager in, at some point or other, that could compromise the agent's relationship. Um, on the other hand, managers do want their clients to have agents. So if you get a manager first who believes in you, that manager has relationships with agents and that manager will open the door to agents that the manager thinks would be a good fit. And that manager will be more inclined to create essentially a team around you that will work for you. So that's the value of having a manager first. Is there a, um, is there a, recipe that's different for getting a manager than for getting an agent is it still a question of you have to know and have, you have to have five pieces or you have to have enough content for them to show or is it a case that you can approach them sooner in your career look the manager and the agent and the lawyer and the mm -hmm. pr person they're all working for you the artist mm -hmm. so you want somebody who can define a strategy for moving your career forward that makes sense. The more you give them, the more they can, and, and they should be willing to discuss that with you. The more you give them, the more they can say, all right, I know what we can do with this. I know, you know, this, I know who would like this. This producer would like this. This casting director would like this. This studio executive would like this kind of material. And, but if you don't give them enough, they can't do that. And so, um, and when you're meeting with those people, considering signing with them, when you're having a signing meeting, it's a two-way interview. They're not just interviewing you, you should be interviewing them. If you're not comfortable that they're sufficiently excited about your talent and that they have some idea of how they would begin introducing you to the marketplace, 
what are you moving forward on? Why are you going to shake hands and get in business together? You're not in a position to create a strategy for your own career. You're going to have to re rely upon agents and or managers to actually define that strategy. And then you're going to be a part of that team in implementing that solution. So well, you, can't, you, can't, you can't design a complete strategy for yourself because you don't know the buyers well, either at all or, or well enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, you want to act, you know, you want to do series, you know, you want to, you know, you know what kinds of things you want to do, but you can't navigate into those offices without some help. That makes, that makes very good sense. One of the reasons I wanted to interview you is I don't know anybody else who's in the specific, who has a specific interest in actually grooming people to be successful. When you and I were talking initially, you said that agents don't have time to provide remedial training in business skills. They don't have time to, they just don't have time to coach. And they have, they have, most of them have no interest in doing that. Right. And, and you also, and the same is true with managers to some degree, they, they expect to be able to put you into the room and they're going to see if you sink or swim and, and they can provide, if the deal's underway and there's a problem, they can help solve it. But it's not going to be the case that if you, after, if, if you go into the room and you don't sell when you should have sold, they're not going to take you out and go, this is what you did right. This is what you did wrong. They're not going to debrief you because that's not their gig. They'll, you know? they'll, send you, they'll send you out to two or three meetings like that or four or whatever, mm -hmm. one depending. And they'll go, all right, this person can't close and then move on. So what's interesting is that um, you do actually have a specific in interest in doing that kind of coaching. Well, you can look at a package and you can actually say, okay, this is what you're sending out. And this is what, this is how the person that gets this is going to respond to it. You're in a position to provide specific training or coaching in the, not just how to get the agent, but also the part about how to get in the room and then close. Like things like how to take notes in such a fashion that you don't I, irritate people. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I do all of it, including, by the way, I've had a number of coaching sessions recently mm -hmm. where some, somebody's come to me with a specific project and said, I, you know, I'm stuck. I don't know how to move this project forward. And we, we talked about it and mm -hmm. defined a strategy for how to actually take the project from being, you know, just something great that's sitting on the writer's desk at home. This was actually a writer, producer, director. And I told him, you know, we, we, we defined a strategy. I didn't tell him and we, we worked together on it and we defined a strategy for how he could move his project to give it more and more strength and more and more visibility uh, and move it toward the mainstream. It's about solving problems. Some people I coach have agents and managers. And again, they don't have these, these conversations. Uh, one guy came to me recently, he had a manager, but not an agent manager happened to be a friend of his a friend of mine rather, a friend of mine uh and he said you know i can't get this guy on the phone to talk about what's going on or whatever and he gave me a little bit of history that he had with the guy and i gave a suggestion about how to do it and a week later he said oh, i'm having a meeting with him and whatever and it's all everything's great so you know i play a little bit of psychologist and uh strategist you have a successful career you'll always have issues again and again and again in the course of the career there's always something different right so and, and you need people that have been in the in the in the room in the situation to understand how to give you the correct advice the advice comes from a from a range of experience yes. and if you haven't had the experience it's it's virtually impossible to figure out a solution that's viable that's in fact why you sign with agents and managers and why one might hire a coach. I mean, Jane Fonda's, what, 70 years old, give or take? I don't know how old she is. A couple Oscars. And what does she need to hire a, an acting coach for? And what does she need a therapist for in her first season of Race and Frankie? Because she's confronting a set of problems that she hasn't confronted before because she's never done episodic television. We were chatting about a variety of things, but one of the things I talked to you about was I had a, had a friend who had actually produced a pilot and they, with the notion that it would someday w would become a, a show. And you go, you know, it has never worked in the industry. And, and in my entire career, I have yeah. never seen somebody produce a pilot um, for something that was supposed to go on television or even premium web channels. I have never seen that work. And yet, if you, I hear that advice routinely. Shoot a pilot. Shoot a teaser reel. But all these, it's like, you know, I see tons of people producing pilots, or I see tons of people going out trying to raise money to produce pilots. I've never seen it work. And there's a, there are reasons why it doesn't work. 
The primary reason being that all of those end users, all of those platforms, the networks and the cable companies, they want to have a hand in developing what they put on their network because they're, they've got a brand mm. and they've got very strong feelings about what their shows should be. You can't produce something a priori before they get involved and have them love it. They can figure out that it's got the potential to be something that works and then they want to have their hand in developing it. Right. It's, it's often, by the way, annoying how involved they want to get. For writers and, and producers, it can be annoying because some of those development executives think they're actually producing the show. And that's one of the things that's changed over the years in the business. They get much more involved than they used to. That's why you can't sell a finished pilot. But it's also, that's another reason in terms of being able to get coaching or advice on specifically what to do with a, with a produce, with um, an executive that is becoming more a part of the creative process than he perhaps has the capacity to succeed at. <laughs> you know, there are ways to handle that. Right. There are ways to handle that. So, there, are ways to, there are ways to take really terrible notes and make the executive feel good. You developed um, this platform called Showbiz Central. My platform, uh, Showbiz Central, is designed for working professionals. It's designed to provide both features and information to enable people to more effectively manage their careers and projects, whether or not they're represented. Mm -hmm. So we have customized uh, portfolios that uh, look very different than everybody else's. And when you send out your portfolio to introduce yourself to somebody or to submit yourself, you're not just sending out a link. You're actually embedding the, the main page of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. We embed the main page of your portfolio into the email. So when they open up the, the recipient opens up the email, instead of just seeing your message with a link, they actually see your message and they see this overview page that's got some key credits. It's got, you know, an abbreviated bio. It's got your headshot or avatar. It's got your name, your physical dimensions, your main physical dimensions. If you're an actor, your con you know, and a contact button that either will enable them to send you a message or enable them to uh, send a message to your, to your agent or manager. Uh, we have information about things that are happening around town. We you can look up shows that are uh, on network or on cable, or we curate current programming from 50 different digital platforms. Yes. Industry directory. Um, we have a glossary of terms in case there's something you you don't know, uh, some term you came across, contract term, a studio term, acting, writing, directing term that you're not familiar with. You can look it up if we don't have it. You can send us a, a question about uh, about the term and we'll add it to the to the glossary mm -hmm. uh, so and we are currently building a whole suite of casting tools which will be done sometime this summer and i think you mentioned that one of the reasons you wanted to build the platform was the fact that there's a tremendous amount of information that has to be managed by all the participants in the industry agents and agents the, the content creators, the writers, the actors, the producers, showrunners, da, da, da. there's a huge quantity of information and there's no consistent place and user interface that lets people manage it. So things get lost and go missing all of the time. Well, and some things aren't available at all. I mean, I have a friend that uh, is producing a series for PBS right now in West Virginia. He does a lot of location shooting. Uh, he produced uh, last year's four hour miniseries on Bonnie and Clyde for the History Channel. Uh, and he says whenever he goes to a location, he has to do local hires. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere online for him to find a local sound technician or, you know, gaffers or DP or whatever, whatever his needs are. I was having lunch with a couple of producer friends the other day. And one was saying, you know, when, when they're putting a project together, they have to, uh, you know, finding out who rep represents people and how to get to them there's very specific information they're looking for that they don't they're not able to get easily sometimes so, some things are available on imdb imdb pro uh but there's not an efficient place anywhere to get all of this information and to manage your career so you know we provide contact management uh literally if you if you are out of your office and you have a tablet or a cell phone uh, you can get to all your contacts. You can get to 
you know, information. You can send out your portfolio. You can do talent searches. And by the way, the motivation for creating it was started out to be just to provide artists, uh, since most of them are not represented, uh, provide artists a way to more effectively market themselves. And as I worked on it, I realized there's a bigger need in the business. Executives need help. Uh, hiring executives need help. Agents and managers need help. So uh, the idea expanded. I really enjoyed the... Um the look and feel of the platform when I was there. So I wanted to, that's one of the reasons I wanted to mention it. Um, so let's just take a quick look at, um, see if there's any questions and I have to check my email because there's a whole bunch more that have gone there. One of the questions is how important are festival awards towards securing a good agent? Anything that validates your talent is an asset. And the more important the festival, the more valuable the festival award. Really? You know, there are certain festivals that are, you know, high profile con and Tribeca and South by Southwest. And there's a few festivals. Uh, there's, there's thousands of festivals, by the way, around the world every year. And so there's a lot of opportunities to get your film seen. Uh, but the more important festivals and the more important competitions add real value. Uh, but any, anything that where somebody has acknowledged that you've done something good is an asset. Very cool. Is there, um, if you want to direct features, does it make sense to produce short films or should you spend, or should you actually go ahead and try to produce micro budget features? Both. I mean, you know, anything that shows your filmmaking skills is going to help you. Um, I was at William Morris when we all got a chance to sit down in our conference room and look at a short film that was produced by an AFI student mm -hmm. uh, of Tim Burton. A film was Frank and Weenie, mm -hmm. only 15 or 20 minute film, and everybody went nuts. He got signed off of that and he got his first movie, and you know, that was an extraordinary, uh, that was a really extraordinary short film, but I mean, he did it with one, with one film. Um, you know, uh, Stone and Parker, South, South Park guys, mm -hmm. and around a video Christmas card mm -hmm. that ended up getting passed all over town because it was hysterical. Mm -hmm. They did it, you know, they did the animation themselves. It was very clunky amateur animation. And now we've been watching it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we love that animation. And it's really simple paper cutouts and whatever. They do it a little more sophisticated now, but the look is the same. They did it with a video. So sometimes you can do it with one extraordinary piece of film. And sometimes it takes several. But whether you do it with a short or whether you do it with a micro budget film, it's all about showing off your filmmaking chops. So you got to make it remarkable in some way, the storytelling, the camera work, the lighting, the casting, what, whatever it is, or whatever combination of things, you got to, you got to make people, you got to, you got to make it so that people look at it and go, wow, this is, this is unique. This is a talent. So it's not the case that it's not the case that it's not the case that if I just produce a, um, a feature, the fact that it's a feature, doesn't prove anything it actually has to be good it has to be the case that people watch it and go this is amazing so it's not just the fact that it's a certain length or anything here's, like that. here's the thing you have to understand that the people you need to watch it in order to open the doors for you that you want opened they're watching tons of stuff mm -hmm. it's not easy to impress them so it's got to be really good when i was I spent a short period of time after I stopped agenting in the 90s, I was working for uh, an ex-client of mine who was a very high profile comedy showrunner at the time. And we did a pilot for CBS. And over a two month period, I read 400 scripts. Now, when you read 400 scripts in eight weeks, you get dull. Mm -hmm. you, you start to question whether you would recognize a good script. Mm -hmm. Here's what, I've, here's what I discovered happens. When you're really, really dull and you're moving around from your desk to the couch to you're finding ways to just try to keep yourself awake because you're reading yet another, you know, Will and Grace or Friends or whatever the scripts are at the time. The really good scripts make you laugh. Really? Everything else puts you to sleep. That's funny. So no matter how many things you see, when something is really good, it stands out from the crowd. That's what you're trying to do. 
Nobody can tell you how to make it unique or how to make it good. That's a function of your voice and your talent. So are the rules, uh, somebody has a question about uh, reality shows. Is it the case that um, reality shows are pitched differently from standard, from uh, standard narrative pieces or is it the same, sort of the same set of rules that, you know, did, in that case, does it make sense to make a first episode or to make a sizzle reel or is it the case that when you're pitching a reality show, once, once again, you should go in with a content, you go in with a killer concept rather than... I, I always discourage people from trying to sell reality shows. There's just not enough money in it, you think, or? The profit margin is so low that most of the companies producing, if not all, the companies producing reality shows don't take or don't want to take pitches from the outside because they don't want to have to pay somebody for their idea. The ideas, you know, they, they create the ideas internally or they buy ideas from people that are already making reality shows. Right. So it's not that you, it's not that somebody couldn't sell a reality show somewhere, mm -hmm. but you look at the percentages. It's, it's such a low percentage possibility that you could sell something. Why spend the time and energy? Right. Well, the other thing is it's also an industry that's relatively easy. It, I always tell people, you want to break in, you want to, you want to produce a film, make your first thing a documentary because you don't got to deal with SAG or the unions for the most part. You can just make it, make your you film. You want to do your stuff. And right. by the way, the money, the big money in reality shows mm -hmm. is not in doing a hit series on a network. Sponsorship. The big money is in the format rights when you sell them regionally mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. The profit margins are very low mm -hmm. uh, for shows. So, if you sell a show to a production, if you manage to sell a reality show, mm -hmm. they're not going to share on the format rights. That's right. So well, you're, not gonna, you're not going to make all that money anyway. And I knew somebody that did uh, reality shows. He said, you know what? We get all, we, and I will say they did weird reality shows, but he said, we get all of our money from the sponsors. We're effectively a commercial. So I don't have to make any money in distribution. I don't care about the distribution deal. I'm just looking for the largest possible distribution because I'm making I'm making an endless ad. But he owns the show. Right, and he owns the show. Right, that's exactly right. So you he said, if you don't own the show, you don't have you know pitching to a production company as a show creator. There's no money. It's just not enough money to make it worthwhile. Let me go ahead and quickly check to see what the other questions are that I have for. Wow. Oh my God. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> me, it's gone. Got a little haywire. Just give me two seconds here. Um, let's see. Um, so someone says that in order to get a good agent, people want an industry referral. Um, how do you get around this? Is that accurate? Do you think people, agents are only interested in looking, good agents are only looking at people that have recommendations from inside the industry or will people actually look at the content directly? The warm introductions are always best. The problem is it's not so much that agents won't look at something that doesn't come through an introduction. It's that they simply don't have the time. There's mm -hmm. so many people that want representation that they're, they're more open to looking at somebody if that somebody's already been validated by somebody else that they know and trust. So, which also means that when you're asking for when you meet people and you're asking for referrals to agents, don't expect anybody to say yes, because if they don't know your work, if they haven't read your script, if they haven't looked at your reel, they're not going to introduce you to anybody. I'm always fascinated when I see people reach out to a networking group that they belong to, or, you know, a situation where they know a lot of people that are percolating in the business and circulating in the business. And they say, can anybody introduce me to an agent? And the answer is going to be no, hundred percent of the time. Because with every introduction, the person making the introduction is sticking their neck out uh, creatively. They're never going to make a recommendation unless they know your work and unless they really think you're great. So if they don't, if they don't call you and say, well, let me read your script or let me read your five scripts or let me look at your sizzle reel, they're never going to make an introduction. Wow. You've got to get, you've got to build relationships. And if you can't get, if you can't build relationships with the people at the top of the totem pole where you want to get to, start at the bottom. Start with the assistants. Start with the guards at the gate. I mean, you got to start, you know, 
you got to start with people at your level. The assistants want to be agents. They need, they want to, they want to build relationships in the talent community, reach out to other artists, work on student films. You're going to, if you, if you're working, excuse me, on independent projects or student films or commercials, you're going to meet people from time to time, probably on a regular basis, you're going to meet people that also work on mainstream studio things and you're going to build relationships. Go to work as an extra. Mm-hmm. Get on the set any way you can. Mm-hmm. Get a job in craft services. Get on the set. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Be friendly and network and meet everybody. Mm-hmm. Do, your well, job. Do your job when you're on the set. Okay. Offer to, you know, be a stand-in, be an extra. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I think I'm always shocked at that it's a collaborative business. So the object of the game is collaborate, find people and collaborate. It's like get, get into the game because people can't tell what you're doing when you're sitting on the sidelines. Sure. So this is <coughs> one other question. So Mark said not to tell the agent during the interview that you want to do both features and TV because they think you're, you'll, they'll think you're not focused. If one has written features, one which was released and it sold a couple of others, but is actually more interested in TV, how does one approach that situation? Well, if you you tell the truth, I mean, if you sold something, that's to your credit. So you say, I've sold a couple of features, but I but I would really, you know, I'd really like to focus on TV right now. I really love the form, and I want to write television. And hopefully, you've written half a dozen sample episodes and maybe one pilot script um, to show the agent your skill as a television writer. But by the way, if you have a feature script, I've read lots of features that are easily adaptable to television. Using a feature script as a potential uh, pilot, not that they would shoot the feature, but that they would look at the feature and say, all right, this, is, this can be a series, that's perfectly okay. And, it, and if you're writing something on spec, if you wanna write a spec pilot, I mean, I think you should have, if you're a comedy writer, I think you should have a half hour pilot script. If you're a drama, I think you should have an hour script. But if you have multiple pilot ideas, and you've got an idea for a series that could also make a great feature, write the feature because you got two ways to sell it. You can sell it as a feature and you can potentially sell it as a series. If you write a pilot script, you can't sell that as a feature. So this one I'm gonna to have to read out loud. <laughs> so what if you're not a young writer, hence um, not just promoted from the mail room, et cetera. I'm middle-aged, was a development exec for 17 years, wrote a spec, and that's been a finalist in two competitions and a semi-finalist in two others. And it's a project with sequel or franchise potential. I think what you'd say is that the person needs to actually, so you've got one script and that seems to be doing well. So like, do we have four, you know, several others as well? Yeah, I mean, that's my first question is the whole, the whole question is framed around, I've got this one script, it's, you know, done well in these contests and whatnot. And, could, it could be a franchise. What else have you done? You know, are you really ready? That's, that's one part of the answer. The other part is, although it's a little tougher to get in the door when you're older because too many agents are too traditional about um, who they want to work with, um, I had my greatest success at the tail end of my career with a middle-aged guy who was selling insurance when I signed him. Really? He was 43 years old, 43, 45, somewhere in their mid 40s. Overweight, not attractive, no connections really, um, and sold insurance for a living. Had a family, three kids. Uh, He came to me via a manager friend who found him online, read uh, some excerpts of his work, contacted him she liked it, contacted him, read a few scripts. And based on her referral, I read him. I took two scripts home the first weekend, read it, knocked me out, brought him into my office. First guy in my career that before I even had a discussion with him about what he wanted to do, he sat down in my office and I said, I want to work with you. I'd never done that before. That's amazing. And I, within six months, we sold a pilot to Fox and a pilot to HBO. And the pilot to HBO got picked up to series and ran for two seasons. And uh, he's working steadily as a writer, producer in television now. And he sold his insurance company. Um, I got him his first staff job on a series for CBS. And, you know, can't do that every day, but his writing was exceptional. Not only 
fighting exceptional, but when he went to work on staff, he blew everybody away because he could churn out scenes quicker than anybody on the show, including the executive producer. Wow. So, the, so, so the good news is that talent, talent and skill and craft and ability to do business trumps age. It's not it, age well, it trumps, trumps, but you have to find the people that actually have a passion for representing talent and aren't aren't committed to the biases of the business and aren't committed to well, they, the person's got to be twenty five years old and a graduate of USC film school and you mm -hmm. know et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, and there are people like that that are that are interested in the talent. So but, it, have, but that's also true for just about any other, any other aspect of the industry. Every, right. single, every person coming into the industry has their own preconceptions and this is the kind of people I wanna work with and this is the kind I wanna, so there's all these, it's a huge mass of pre prejudice and preference that you're gonna to have to deal with. So that's just that particular one, you know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So somebody says, are there agents that primarily focus on getting a, a finished product, like a feature film, an acquisition deal, or do you have to do the film circuit and hope somebody, somebody will approach you? And I, th I think we've kind of, uh, I think I've, we've kind of addressed that in our dialogue, which is anytime you're talking about a single project, you're in trouble because it's not your career. Agents are not interested in one hit wonders. They're just, it's, there's no way for them to do the You're career. not, you're trying to launch a writing career, not sell a project. Mm -hmm. You want a writing career mm -hmm. or not. Now, mm -hmm. you, your career will involve selling individual projects, but the focus can't be on selling the project. Your focus has to be on, I want to be a film writer. That's, that's okay, that's perfect. You know, and, and by the way, the market changes. So there are periods where the studios will buy finished scripts, and so there are agents that take on the task of just finding projects that they think they can sell and you, you'll go through a two-year period where they just you know there was there was a guy when i was at william morris that did that he just he didn't represent writers so much as he represented scripts um but most of the time the studios there's a balance they want to they want to hear pitches by writers that they've worked with already and they want to see scripts from writers they work with and they don't have necessarily an appetite for a lot of other stuff that just comes in but navigating into those offices with a script or a pitch requires the help of an agent. Mm -hmm. It just does. So the bottom line is getting to the agents means having, having enough ammunition to provide the agent that validates that you're not only a good writer, but a writer who can deliver over and over and over again. So you've got to have multiple, you've got to have multiple projects. That's, that's, I think that's, um, that drives us what I would expect in any case. It's because it is, a, it, successful creatives are prolific. That's just the nature of, you're making your living from this thing. That's right. Uh, so, and, and uh, this is sort of, I think, the last uh, question on the list. There's a couple of other ones that I'll have to email you because they're fairly detailed. But this is one about, um, after being a loyal working actor to my agent for decades, my agent dropped out of the industry, so I'm no longer have um, representation. And I've had, I found myself having to look for an agent for the first time in over a decade. And even though I work consistently, the impression I'm getting is, um, I need to pay to play in order to um, get an agent willing to represent me at the next level, or I have to pay for workshops just to get someone to look at me. And I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do. Am I, is it correct that I have to pay to play or that I have to go to workshops to meet agents or is there a better way for me to meet? Well, I don't, there's, I don't understand elements of the question. So when this mm -hmm. person says they work consistently, mm -hmm. I don't know what, what that means. Are they getting paid? Are those yeah. paid jobs? Or are they just writing on spec consistently? If they're well, I paid. think this is an actor. So, so it's an actor that's been working consistently. So they've been getting cast routinely, but the person... Well, Yes, routinely they shouldn't be having a problem finding representation. Mm -hmm. So there's something amiss in how this person is going about um, getting representation. If they're being, I mean, I'd have to ask a series of questions. Yeah. Where are they working? Are they getting cast by the same casting directors? Mm -hmm. uh, if they are, why, you know, why isn't this person asking the casting directors to introduce him or her to 
agents because the casting directors have relationships. Um, you know, somebody's liking this person's work, you know, and wherever she, he or she is working, there's a director, there's one or more producers, there's a casting director, there's studio or network executives. So there's multiple people with agent relationships. It makes no sense that this person doesn't have representation. So I'd have to, I'd have to sit down with them. If I were doing a coaching session, we'd have to really uh, deconstruct what's going on and figure out where the flaw is in, in the process. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I think, you know, it's 8.30 and we've taken up a lot of your time, which you've been very gracious with, um, especially since you were online 30 minutes early. But um, I'm enjoying it. Very sweet. Um, but now what I'd like to do is, so people, you said that we can um, distribute this recording, so I'm going to edit and, and I'll make it available and I'll send, make it available to you so that you can upload onto your channels as well. Um, but what I'd like is, What's unique about you is that it's possible to work with you. So you have you you don't coach everybody. It's not like this. Somebody can email you and get have you. I don't, do, I don't do coaching on a full time basis. But I do it on a select basis. Uh, I have a website for that. It's markpariser dot com. M mm -hmm. a r p a r i s e r dot com. Mm -hmm. And um, I generally charge two fifty an hour to coach. I treat it. You know I. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a, a career psychologist, so I book out my time at an hour at a time. Well, I want people to come to me when they need help. Sometimes people come once and that's what they need. Sometimes they come once and they come back six months later, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or they do it weekly. At the end of the day, what the coaching is about is really designing a very specific, actionable strategy that the artists can follow up on. Uh, to make things happen and it's always specific to the artist so is there um, so how so people can contact you through your website um, contact me through my website markparizer.com mm -hmm. and, um, and is there is there a way is, is there an appropriate way for them to approach you should they send you what amounts to like three paragraphs that just describe what they're looking for or just a, a no they should just if they if they want to, I offer a free 20 minute consultation. I've, okay. I got quite a few uh, requests for that just off mm -hmm. this the, the mm -hmm. note we sent about the call tonight. So mm -hmm. I've got to figure out how to schedule those. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of time when you add up all the 20 minutes. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, but they should just, just a quick message about, you know, what their issue is. They're looking for representation or they're not sure how to proceed or they've got a problem with a deal. Mm -hmm. and request a, a consultation or or request to uh to book me for an hour the communication shouldn't have you know a synopsis of sure. the script or anything like that i don't want to i first of all i, I don't want if i see that that's what it is i won't read it yeah i don't want I to I have any you know i don't want to be exposed to any ideas prematurely They're it's funny because i have that same thing like, people are always trying to send me like synopsis of things and i go i'm a writer producer I have ideas. I'm good. <laughs> don't no, say like you that. don't. Want, you don't want to do that, and the person on the receiving end doesn't want to get it because there are risks, legal risks, and mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I don't want to chew up more time, but the the problem is that most people feel like if they just can tell you what their story is, you're going to so love it that you're going to want to read it, and that's not the case. I'm planning some workshops. Mm -hmm will be for smaller groups of people. They'll be very, they'll be intensive workshops, so they'll cost more, uh, but they'll be for a small group of people where we actually roll up our sleeves and, and work. And we'll do everything from pitching to uh, well, the business and, you know, just all sorts of things that, that people need to know. So thank you so much for taking the time. I, I am very honored that you did. And thank you. I appreciate everybody that attended and took time out of their evening to listen to me uh, chat away and uh, I hope I hope uh, there was some value there it was a lot thank you so much and I hope you have an excellent day um, and uh, <laughs> I'll send out the email and uh, you'll be hearing from me in the next couple of days okay great thank you Nancy okay bye-bye